Everyone? Nope. Uh, okay, so the way we are going to do it is that uh, I will do a short uh, intro about Matchbox, and then it will be like an interview uh, about uh, ACAR. Okay, so first, uh, Matchbox is a collective and a community of uh, developers that uh, ha uh, help develop developers to build and launch uh, on-chain games. And uh, one of our flagship games is ACAR, which uh, we'll talk about. And um, some things that we are doing is uh, first helping, you know, we're doing a hackathons, we are doing uh, um, grants, we, are, we have more extensive uh, a program called uh, Matchbox Studio. And we're also doing investments and help um, you know, more mature games to uh, find uh, um, more users. And uh, okay, so let's start with uh, with ACAR. So um, first, uh, Thomas, if you want to uh, tell everyone uh, what is ACAR and why you started it and um, how it uh, got started. Okay, so I have a bit of experience programming, and uh, I did start working a free project a year ago. Ah, better? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so yeah, I have a bit of experience in uh, programming and I decided to start working on a web free project a year ago. And, uh, well, we started doing a hackathon and uh, started ACAR, but that was on EVM and we had a lot of uh, limitation because so we decided to switch to Darknet that's how we, we came here. Um, the idea of uh, ACAR, that you come on infinite world, in fact, you left your planet because of the explosion of a star, and you had to travel through the cosmos, the uh, first habitable planet. And uh, that's it. You want to conquer the world. You want to be the, the best player. Cool. And why you choose to uh, build on Starknet and not, uh, and not EVM? I mean, what, what is possible on Starknet that you think is not possible otherwise? Yeah, uh, I think the main limitation with EVM is the price of computation. In fact, there is also the price of storage. But what is really cool is that on Starknet, computation, not, uh, the fee for computation are not proportional. Um, the amount of computation. So the more computation you do, the cheaper per computation step. And this is really cool. Because you can sometimes replace storage by computation. And that's what we did with ACAR. We have an almost infinite world, but this world is not stored anywhere. Just described by a simple algorithm. And that algorithm can be efficiently verified in Darknet. Okay, cool. So, uh, okay, next slide. Okay. Uh, so we'll speak about uh, more about how ACAR works um, in, a, in a bit, but why, why uh, you chose to uh, work with Matchbox uh, community? Yeah, so uh, as you know, Matchbox is, uh, I think, the central point for games building on, uh, on Starknet. And uh, that, that was uh, because we have a lot of problems to fix with ACAR, and that was... A good idea, I think, to share solution with other people building on uh, on Starknet. And well, Matchbox, this is exactly what they are doing. So that's what we decided to work with them. Cool. Okay. So now the interesting part: what are the challenges, and um, how resources uh, an on-chain world, uh, how you created uh, resources an on-chain world uh, on-chain? Um, yeah. Just tell us how how it works. Okay. Well, I, I can explain you how the world works first, and maybe resources uh, after, mm -hmm. if you want. Just going to, to switch a few slides. Maybe. Do I need to... Okay, nice. Yeah, the world. So we had, uh, we, we wanted four things for the world. First, we wanted it to be infinite, or almost infinite, so really big. Uh, secondly, we wanted it to be realistic, not just completely random, and we wanted it to make sense, to look like a real world. Then, we wanted cheap interaction, so if you want to verify something that you've done on the world, you want it to be cheap, otherwise people are not going to play. And then, we need it to be fast. So, we need people to be able to, show, to, to see the world on their screen, and we want it to be trustless, as trustless as possible. 
that people don't have to trust a central server to see what the world looks like. Uh, yeah. So this is what the map used to look like when we first started it. And you can see that this is pretty slow. You, you need to wait a, a lot to, to see everything. And this is also not looking very good because as you can see, all the plots look like squares, which is not really realistic. And this is the last version. So you can click on uh, different plots. So blue is the uh, ocean, plus has various terrains, mountain, etc. And yeah, that looks better and that's much faster. So I'm going to explain how we, we did it, how we implemented it. Okay. Uh, you have to see the Acre world as a big grid. Okay? So basically, this is just a storage variable a function which maps two coordinates to a single struct, which is a plot struct. Okay? So this is a representation of a grid with a coordinate given uh, to uh, every single plot, so 0, 0, 1, 0, etc. I did not write all of them because uh, it would be uh, too long. And the first thing that we do is that we map those two coordinates to a single number. Okay? So this 0, 0 becomes 0, 0, 1, 1, etc. This, is, this gives a kind of spiral, 0, 1, uh, etc. Okay? And this is going to be really useful because we can use it to seed a random number generator. So uh, a random number generator is something that gives you numbers that are pretty, that are looking random, but it is deterministic. So you give it an input, which is a seed, this number, and every time you give the same input, it will give you the same list of random numbers. Okay? And we use this, this random number generator to generate a second coordinate inside every plot. So this is what I represented in red here, just various points. And uh, they look random. But anyone doing the same calculation than us will get the same point and the same location. Okay. So that, that looks bad because I'm pretty bad at uh, drawing straight line. But those are supposed to be straight lines, trust me. Uh, uh, I tried to, to connect all the points to the nearest point around them, so that gives you a kind of graph with a lot of triangles. Okay? And uh, this is very useful. I think this is called a Delaunay graph, and it allows you to do uh, something that looks good, better than just squares uh, for plots, and this is using the Voronoi algorithm. So the Voronoi algorithm is pretty simple. You take the various triangles that, you, that you've done, so this has a line from the triangles. You take the middle of all those lines, and you, you, you draw a perpendicular straight line, okay, like this. And this will give you a polygon around every point. That looks good. That looks a bit random. Uh, this is what uh, you get if you, if you perform it on uh, some random points. And this is also used by biologists to simulate how cell, biological cells look like. So I think those are cells from a plant, not a human, but this will be the same with a human cell. And this gives you really cool plots. They look good. But the, it does not help you to get a world. You just have the shape. So to get the, the world, to get something that looks good, that is not just purely random, you, you just need to use a, a random number generator, which is not too much random, and that's called a noise. So this is a simplex noise. It gives you, from a two-dimensional coordinates, a random number between minus one and one. So here, minus one is white, and one is black. So yeah, that, that looks quite random, and we can use it with uh, calculate elevation, but also to calculate climate. And from those two data, we can determine what your cell, what your plot is going to look like. So if you have a negative elevation, that must be water. If you have a positive elevation and a specific climate, then that can be uh, savanna, for example. This is nice, because when you want to check that someone is, for example, fishing, you can just do the computation of the 
coordinates he gave you, verify that he's indeed on those coordinates, and then check that those coordinates give you a negative value for elevation so that he's indeed fishing on water and not in a... So after I spoke about the map, what is the resources in ECO? Okay. Well, I think you can, uh, you can guess what resources are. They are used to represent uh, things like gold or values that could be really uh, similar resources that we, we have on Earth. So, for example, uh, yeah, metals, but that could be armor, that could be stuff that is by players. And uh, the problem when you want to represent that kind of stuff in blockchain, that it is quite hard to map it to uh, coordinate in space and time. So you have the ERC20 standard, which allows you to map uh, resources to um, or anything, to an address. But the problem with that is that well, it, it is not linked to a specific location on the ACAR map. And most importantly, it is not linked to a specific location in time. And, and that's a problem, because what we want with, in ACAR is that when you have resources in a, at a specific point, and you want to send it to another point, you need to wait. You don't want, it, don't want the transfer to be instant. So that makes the game more interesting. And stupid way to do it would be Okay, let's just associate with the storage variable some resources to a location. And when someone wants to move, he needs to do two transactions. First one, remove this. Second one, to, re to redeem them on another location in the future. Or you could use a keeper network like Pilato to do it automatically. But this has several problems. First, expensive to do tr two transactions. And secondly, you cannot predict what is going to be the blockchain, what are going to be blockchain fees in the future. So that's kind of unreliable. Uh, yeah, you need to rely on external, external thing to perform the transaction. So not very good. Yeah. Thank you. So that's to represent the problem. You want to send and choose at five plots, a distance of five plots, and maybe you want it to take two hours. Okay. So here is the design we came up with. Uh, to a location, we associate a lot of convoys. So a convoy, like an account, can contains things. It can contain resources. So resources are in fact conveyables. Conveyables can only be owned by convoys that are part of a, of a location. When you want to send a convoy from location A to location B, there is a trick. It is not just associated to, to a location. Because in the convoy, there is a field that is called availability. And when you want to move your convoy, you just have to remove it from the location, append it to another location, and change availability field. So when someone wants to send it again, if the timestamp is inferior to current the availability field, he won't be able to spend it. Does that make sense? So just for you to understand, convoys are basically programmable accounts. That that's the only way to access resources. You cannot uh, access resources without them being inside of this programmable account. Right? I was right. Or? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's right. They are not really a but you can do I speak correctly. But you can see them like this, and that's a, that's a good way to. Okay, cool. Um, anyone have questions before moving to? Okay. So, how do you see um, building on ACO, and um, what, like, how, how do you think composability uh, take part in, in ACO, what already people built, and uh, what do you think people uh, could be building in the future? Is it better? Yeah, oh, <laughs> thank you. Okay, so yeah, you, okay, like this. So, you are going to... Uh, sorry, what I was saying, I was talking about gold in real world, yeah? So you, you are going to trade debt, not real gold. And with ACAR, we want it to be the same thing. People want, when they, when they want to do advanced economy on ACAR, they won't use ACAR gold. 
because if they want to, they will have to wait a few days for it to, to travel. It can be dangerous. People can try to steal your gold, to steal your resources. That's not a good thing. So instead, we are going to work on the guild system. The guild system uh, is something created by Sam, uh, another developer, and it can be used for many different things. And we are going to add a plugin for it. And this plugin will allow you, for example, to, to manage diplomacy, but also to manage debt. So you can, when you have a guild, decide to emit debt recognition for any resources of a car. So for example, that can be, uh, that can be gold. And that debt recognition is an ERC-20. And it can be used by anyone. It can be traded, it can be traded instantly. You can send it to anyone. It is not bound to a specific location in space or in time. And that's very good because uh, this allows many things. And but how is that linked to a car? Well, the thing that is cool with this debt recognition is that you have the right to redeem it whenever you want. You can go ask any member of the guild that has some gold, burn your debt recognition token, and force him to send you the real ACAR gold token. So that means that debt recognition, as long as the emitter of the debt is solvable, has real values. And we hope that this will create a lot of interesting mechanism in ACAR, but we are not sure. So we will see what we are going to, to create with that. What are some of the things that you, you already see? Like uh, you spoke about synthetic assets uh, and uh, programmable mechanics with that. And um, what do you think would be interesting with um, collaborations between uh, different people in the games and also different groups? Yeah. Um, I think this could be used by players to leverage money because I carry at the start, at the beginning, should work in a season. So at the end of the season, the best player who has the best score or the best guild, they can redeem, uh, they can, in fact, they can keep a part of the profit generated by the game. And uh, so you want to be the best player. And if you really want to, to be the best player and you have some money to win, you might want, you might think that this is a good idea to spend a bit of money to be a better player and to, me, to win more money at the end. And how can you do that? Well, you could decide to purchase debt from other guild and redeem it in game. But then this will give an incentive for people to gather a lot of resources and sell them as debt to other people to get money really quickly and to not have to wait for the end of the game. So yeah, this is an example usage. But this opens a lot of um, possibilities because if having uh, AKR resources has some values, people might want to pay other people to attack, for example, big guild that have a lot of gold, to steal their resources, and then their debt recognition will not be worth anything, but then they would have real gold and they would be able to emit their own debt. And uh, so, so the first guild might decide that it is worth to pay a insurance, so that they, they think that it's worth to pay people to protect them, and then people could think that this is a good way, a good idea to pay other people to be like mercenaries. So yeah. Uh, is there anything else you want to um, speak about regarding the future of ACAR and things you're excited about uh, in ACAR, but, but also in general in uh, on-chain games and, and, and what could be built? Um, do you have a, a, an example of uh, something uh, more specific? Because uh, this is I quite... Mean, uh, I mean, you, you mentioned endless models. So uh, okay. if you want yeah. to speak about that a little <clears throat> yeah, uh, the goal will be uh, for ICAR at the end to be endless, so that when you start, it never stops. But this is a big problem. Uh, we do not have an answer for everything. Uh, so for example, how to make the game interesting for new players, when you have players that have a big experience, that have a very good army, uh, how, to give, uh, how to give incentive for players to play because there is no end, so there is no clear winner at the end. So th those are big problems. But this is also so interesting. You, you, you can think to, about so many cool stuff with that. Uh, one example with this would be, okay, let's say that ACAR is fully decentralized. We no longer own anything, and uh, we cannot longer do uh, anything for the game. How do we keep the game evolving? Um, something would be, to maybe give some token to players that actually play, and they would have the right to use this token 
vote or updates uh, that could be performed to the game. But then who will be doing those uh, updates? And uh, I think the best way to do it would be to, to create, to allow people to create their own HR universes, to play with their friend. So you, you will play with uh, maybe with, with maybe 10 people uh, only. And that, that would be maybe like in Minecraft. You know, in Minecraft, a lot of people create modification to the game for them, for themselves, for their friends. And sometimes uh, the company that does Minecraft thinks that a mod modification is a good idea and they decide to, to add it to the game. Well, that could be the same thing, except that that will not be any central company. Instead, people would vote because they think, oh, that modification that you did for you is looking really good and we want to add it to the game. And because everyone agrees, it will be added. Uh, that, that would be something that is interesting. Um, another thing that I think is really interesting, and I think it is more general to ancient gaming, this is how do you uh, uh, fight against people that find solution to your game. So what I mean by that is that with HR, we basically create problems, but we do not think about the solution. So uh, one example of this is when you send converse from location B A to location B, you do not think about what is, um, we do not provide you a way to find the shortest path. You have to find it by yourself. And this is a complex problem. It is not just the shortest path. This is because you, you have different ways to, to travel. You can use boat, for example, and boat has are faster on ocean. So you have to, to think about using my resources, what is the best way, the cheapest or the fastest way to go wherever I want. And we do not give you answers. So maybe some people at first will be good humans, smart humans, and they will find a way to do it. But I think that in the future, the best player will be just people that created an algorithm that is really efficient, that is very, very good at this problem. And that is a problem because what if 1% of players have this algorithm? They will be so much better than the other that it will not make sense to play the game. And uh, I think the best solution for it, if you, want, if you want to really be decentralized and we do not want to patch the game every time, will be to create another web client that will be something like HR Plus. You will have to pay something like maybe, maybe $5 a month to use it. And it will include those um, algorithm to help you to play so that people, uh, every people that want to really be good at the game will pay it. So that will be a way for us to continue to make money, even though we do no longer own the game, just because we created a good web client and people want to use it. And uh, if it is possible to have better information, they are going to, to, to do it. And at the same time, this is fair because all people uh, play with the same, the same, uh, the same algorithm. And something that is interesting with that is that this is going to change the way that people play uh, over time. So uh, at first, people might try to solve the problem, how to get faster, etc. It's a real technical problem. And in the future, so maybe in a, a few years, people will really focus on how to, how to be strategic and how to... It, it, will, it might become a social game. It might become... A, just interesting to to make big deals, to make kind of uh, useful alliances and, and, and cool mechanism, but social mechanism instead of just uh, finding a good solution to the problem that might all been solved. Actually, uh, we only have two minutes, but uh, I think there is a lot more to talk about. Like if if uh, people that build those uh, algorithms can rent it to to other people to play better. <laughs> But uh, yeah, there is a lot. Uh, anyone have uh, questions? Uh, so, so you, you think that people are going to, to give the algorithm for free? Is that right? Well, maybe. Then that would be really cool because we would not have to, to do this. And uh, it would be very nice if everyone can play with, uh, with the same, uh, same algorithm. But I don't think so. I think that if people don't have incentives to give... Uh, their advantages to other people, they won't do it. Maybe some, but I, I think if you have a way to make sure to win a car because you found a solution to the big problem, you might want to keep it for you and to stay the best player. So if that's not the case, that's really nice. And if that's the case, I think a car plus will be a way to fight against that.
uh, how is it possible to like make on-chain games not pay to win where like the also people who don't want to spend too too much money can actually have a good good time thank you um i don't think that you can make it um you, you can you, you can avoid making it pay to win if there is something to win at the end because you, you, if that's even if you make it harder for people to to pay and to build stuff on top of your game which you don't want you want it to be as open as possible well they might just do it in a centralized way and uh, tell their friend okay please give me money and i will give you something in the game so it, yeah the best way will be to just not have anything to win Uh, you just mentioned that it's possible to win the, in the game. So, um, and before that, you said that it's an unstoppable game. So, is there a win condition or no? And uh, secondly, uh, love to know more about the current architecture, whether you use uh, Web to like cloud for uh, maintaining in, it in Web, and how exactly you use uh, stocks here. Okay. So yeah, for the for the first part for the sorry for the first part of your question, um, or no, it is not unstoppable. I I think we do not have clear answers about the issues I mentioned earlier. So how to avoid the best players to be just all players. So we plan to work by seasons. Seasons could last something like three months, and we hope to find a solution sometimes some someday and just create a, a game that never stops. But I I do not have answer for this. And uh, your second point uh, was uh, the architecture, right? Okay, so we, it's pretty simple. We have a smart contract, which uh, allows us to verify any interaction. Uh, so yeah, you, you can trust it, theoretically. We do not have a specific keys to update it or anything. And uh, on the web client, it is the same. You do all the computation in your browser. So the map that you saw earlier is computed on your browser in real time. So if you have a really old computer, it might be it might take a few seconds to, to see the world. And the only thing that we that we need to to be centralized is the cache. So I see that Francesco is here, and uh, he built a API Barra, which uh, we are going to use. And this is a, a way for us to index data so that they are uh, available in an efficient way. So anyone can run it if he wants to, and that's called a cache. Basically, every time someone uh, changes something to the world, so maybe he, he creates a colony at a specific location, we're going to index it in a geospatial database so that we can query all the colonies in a specific uh, rectangle, a specific surface, very efficiently, because that would be too painful to just do a request for every single pot. That's it. <laughs> Thank you.